Have you ever wondered what it's like to go so viral that you get more views than the total population of Canada? Jules LeBron. NASA, you can dunk in the dark. Hey everyone, I'm John Timmerman, Chief Monster at Good Monster, and this is Marketing by John. Let's dive in. Hey everyone, I'm John Timmerman, Chief Monster at Good Monster, and this is Marketing by John where I bring all the trends and news that you probably are interested in if your goal is to grow your consumer brand. And first stop, we are talking about the viral TikTok sensation, Jules LeBron. That's right, very demure, very mindful. If you don't know what that is, just Google it. It's gone crazy viral. Basically, Jules created a video where she was talking about her makeup routine. And very demure means like shy and subtle, particularly when it comes to being a woman. And this is the key here. All right, very mindful means very mindful, very, th very thoughtful. And her video was saying how her makeup routine is very subtle. And because Demure relates specifically to being a woman, the haters took that and said, how dare you, right? How dare you say me as a woman should be subtle and shy and stand in the corner and put in my place like we're in the 1950s. That's not what Jules meant, but that's how a lot of people took it, and that's why this thing went viral. They had the haters saying that she was in the wrong, at saying women should be subtle and shy and subdued. Um, and then you had the other side saying, no, she didn't mean that. She just meant she was saying your makeup should be subtle. Your, your, you know, your routine when you're going for a job interview should be subtle and then very mindful, is very mindful about what works for you, and people took it out of context. Nonetheless, it went crazy viral and brands like Fenty Beauty uh, used it, used that very demure, very mindful. But here's the key. It went outside of makeup so much that NASA used it. NASA used the very demure, very mindful uh, moniker or tagline, as I call it now, in their own marketing to tap into that huge amount of virality and communication that was happening. Now, here's what brands can learn. Number one is it's very tough to manufacture virality. Jules didn't even know it was going to be viral. Had no idea, right? It's just like the guy, the ocean spray guy that basically launched TikTok into like the brand world. He was skateboarding, uh, drinking ocean spray, uh, uh, singing a song, right? Went crazy viral. Ocean spray reached out to him, sponsored him, bought him a car. It was crazy. He had no idea that was going to go viral. So even influencers, who this is basically how they make their money, can't manufacture virality with the exception of a Mr. Beast who spends hundreds of millions of dollars to go viral and has spent hundreds of millions of hours, probably him and his team to uh, study how to go viral. But most brands can't really mimic that because they're stunts. Most of these people that are going viral are doing it based on stunts uh, to, to manufacture that virality. That's very hard for a brand to do. But here's what you can learn. You can learn that having a short, sweet, pin of a tagline is good. What I mean pin is like something to kind of stick your, uh, your you know, plant your flag in. Um, so very demure, very mindful. It's short, it's sweet, it's creative, it's curiosity invoking. If you look up the words, you know, they describe sort of a, a play, a, a makeup playbook, so to speak, right? The virality though came in the debate and that's where brands can can really thrive. Now it's risky, but if you do it right, you can thrive off of the debate as long as the brand is not the one to blame on either side of that debate. And usually what I recommend brands do is that if you're going to go this route, if you're going to try to manufacture the debate by reality, present an idea that is not yours as a brand. Present an idea either from somebody else or present an idea that is from nobody and have somebody else deliver it. Have one of your creators deliver it. Have one of your influencers deliver it. Uh, have a celebrity be the one who sort of presents the idea, right? Insert your brand wherever is the best, whether it's product placement or sponsored by or, um, or somehow you weave them in there. But if you have somebody else in your ecosystem delivering the debatable topic on behalf of your brand or including your brand, then you're a bit more protected. And here's the second lesson from Jules is to make sure you're ready. She did not trademark that. Somebody else did. Somebody else trademarked very demure, very mindful. So after 46 million views on TikTok and countless number of PR hits and, and other mentions, somebody else trademarked it, which means now they own all of this uh, viral traffic from a, from a standpoint of who can use that term. She does not. So this is the second lesson for brands is be able to move quickly, be ready to move quickly. That means you need to have a strong community management system and department ready to act on that and feed that back up the, the, to leadership to make decisions quickly. 
And I'll leave you with the best example of this that I can think of right now. And that is Oreos dunk in the dark from like 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, during the Super Bowl, the lights went out during the actual Super Bowl, the power went out or the lights went out. Some people say it was manufactured. Uh, I think because St. Louis, uh, not St. Louis, the saints, I think the new Orleans saints were losing. And so they think that it was manufactured to let them regroup. But, uh, regardless Oreo during the lights out, they, they created, uh, them and their agency, uh, at the time, can't remember who it was created you can dunk in the dark. And it was a simple graphic on Twitter, whereas an Oreo, a hand dunking an Oreo in the dark. It was very timely. It was quick. That's a good example of how you need to be ready to move quick as a brand to tap into virality, whether it's yours or other people's. All right, next, uh, brands are taking a stand against AI. That's right. In an age of AI, brands are starting to say, you know what? Maybe this isn't good for us. And one is the iPad app, uh, design app, Procreate. The CEO came out uh, with a viral tweet, I think, that basically said, I prefer that our products speak for themselves. I really fucking hate Journey of AI. I don't. <laughs> and uh, I can see why they would say that. Uh, in the creative space, there's a debate of, should we let AI create for us? Should we lean on AI to to do this creative for us? Because since the age of humans, creativity has been one of our unique uh, capabilities, our, our, our unique traits that have been very positive. Paintings and art and, uh, you know, chalk, uh, uh, or, or like, not chalk, but like ash paintings and finger paintings on, on the walls of caveman era. Like all of this art and back in the Roman and Greek mythology and and up to today in painting and now digital art, all of this kind of uh, uh, art comes from the left brain. That's creativity. And if we let AI do it for us, does that make us a little less human? So there's that kind of ethical aspect to it. And then there's the other side, which is creatives now can make more money quicker, faster, because AI will help them kind of craft initial versions. And in the marketing space, I see the front lines of this every day. We use AI, but I can certainly tell you that there's some things that AI can do well. Create ideas, create frameworks, um, do quick research, um, create concepts, but there still lacks a few major things when it comes to marketing and advertising. Storytelling. AI doesn't have personal, real stories that are authentic uh, and people can connect with. They can pull stories from other people that have already told the story. We can train it to make up their own stories, but they're not true. They're not authentic and they're not really that well crafted, right? Strategy. Okay. Sure. There's blanket strategies, but to create a truly unique brand strategy, you need truly unique creativity and thought and strategy and insights. And AI is trained based on existing content. So if you want something truly unique, you probably can't get it from AI. Now, will we get to the place where you can? Maybe, probably, but when does it stop? Right. If if ChatGPT and and um, OpenAI and and all of these other firms are basically saying we're giving it guardrails so the AI doesn't go crazy and take over our world, how do you allow it to create its own mind and its own creativity without going crazy and taking over the world? I don't know. I'm not an AI expert, but I could see why some brands are going against AI. I actually think it's pretty powerful from a PR standpoint and a community building standpoint. For brands to say, we do not use AI, we still use humans, is different than most other brands are doing now. So I think it's currently a strong kind of uh, uh, angle and a, a good plant to put in the ground as a brand if you do it right and you can still do it in a way where you can compete profitably with brands that are using AI. Because if you can create content and do it with humans and do it profitably in the face of brands that are using AI to pump out content that's also good, this will perform better. All right, next, this was a big one. Netflix is coming out with an ad product for your brand to be able to run ads on Netflix. Now, this is already a, a thing. Prime Video is doing this. They've been testing this. I've seen video, I'm watching the boys on Prime uh, and seeing commercials here and there. They're testing this, this, this product out. Um, Maybe some of you have seen it too. With the maturity of OTT over the top, um, this is without a doubt, it, you know, it had to happen because there's such a saturation in subscriptions, right? 
I alone have probably seven different subscriptions to Netflix and Prime and Paramount Plus and all these different ones. You do too, I'm sure. Um, it used to be the case where it was just cable TV and Netflix. They were the only ones. They could just charge a subscription and make tons of money just off of that. But there's too much saturation now. There's too many decisions that they have to bolster their subscription revenue with ad products. And it's mostly because other brands, uh, other OTT platforms are doing the same. And so they are doing it different. Let me tell you a quick story. About four years ago, my wife, Lindsay, she comes to me and she goes, John, I have the perfect idea for a business. We should come out with a, an app where if I'm watching Netflix, at the time we were, we were watching House of Cards, right? And she likes um, Claire, is that her name? Very professional suits. She's like, I wish I could just pull, pull up the app, scan a QR code and uh, buy that outfit or search all the outfits just like it. Well, I'm happy to say, Lindsay, that Netflix is now doing just this thing and they're doing it in partnership with Google. Yes, Netflix and Google are partnering uh, specifically for the show Emily in Paris, which is one of top Netflix top shows so that you can actually shop the wardrobe of people in the show. And yes, you can do it just by opening up, uh, I think, Google shopping and just scanning the code or scanning the show or something like that. And then you can basically shop it. So good news, Lindsay. Uh, your app is here. Bad news is we are not the billionaires to have created it. But what does that mean for an advertiser like you or a brand like you? That means you've now got more opportunities to impact people um, at top of funnel awareness stage and even reputation stage. And you can do it in a way that's much better than 20 years ago when it was just uh, TV commercials. Because now these are TV commercials that are highly data backed and highly specific and highly targeted to the exact people who you want to see your ads. So we have basically taken the benefit and, and, and the effectiveness of a TV commercial from 20, 30, 40 years ago in building feeling and brand awareness. And we've combined it with the digital specific targeting of uh, social media ads, paid media, uh, search ads, uh, programmatic and native and all that kind of stuff. And we've combined it into uh, this OTT advertising environment. And when we're sort of seeing a shift away from the bottom of funnel, middle of funnel, you know, data growth hacking sort of uh, effectiveness because of decreased um, uh, targeting capabilities, uh, increasing ad costs, uh, increased privacy concerns, right? We're kind of shifting back to, um, uh, oh, also dark social, which is basically people are not clicking on stuff anymore. They're just sort of like seeing and then making decisions in their head, which you cannot track. When we're seeing this shift back to top of funnel, general feeling, awareness, emotion, trying to get people to love a brand so that they'll go find you and shop wherever they're comfortable. This is great. This is great news. So as a brand, you've got OTT that you can start shifting your ad dollars towards to make people feel something and hopefully they buy. Okay, last little tidbit, I'll make this one quick, I promise, is that mobile shopping is most likely going to officially pass desktop shopping as the preferred channel. Now, you might have thought this is already the case, but actual conversions and checkouts still are dominated by desktop. It's more the consumption, right? Everything else we do is on mobile. That's been the majority for, for quite some time. So, you know, in our world, when we build a website, we build it mobile first right? We make sure it looks great on any platform, but we're very specifically focused on mobile because that's where most people are viewing. When we create content for platforms like TikTok and social media and email, we're always making sure that it looks beautiful and does what we want it to do on mobile. And then we make sure on desktop, obviously it looks great as well. But for specifically the checkout, the conversion point, that has been the majority desktop up until most likely this upcoming fourth quarter. Now, Adobe uh, Analytics, I think, or Adobe, researched like a trillion transactions and uh, 100 million SKUs and uh, projected that as many as 53% of those checkouts, those conversions are going to happen on mobile this fourth quarter holiday season, which is a pretty big deal because that's kind of th crossing the threshold of, of when everything else has been mobile and now checkouts are too which means now everything is mobile, which means in the next five or 10 years, the vast majority of everything we do on the internet is going to be on mobile, including actual transactions. So that's a pretty big deal if you're a brand looking to sell stuff online, which all of you are. And that could also determine how you look at conversions. Uh, where are they happening? Are they happening on your website anymore? Are they happening only on Amazon and marketplaces like TikTok Shop? 
how many are on TikTok Shop and Amazon versus on your website. It will change the strategies that you have year after year for the next foreseeable future. All right, that's it. That's Marketing by John. I'll see you next week.